I'm sure mostly everybody with a taste for RPGs, or more specifically JRPGs, has heard of the Tales series in one way or another. Whether it be from personal experience with them, nods via message board topics, or someone you know talking down about how they're all the exact same bad anime game with a slightly different bad anime style after they've only played one. <clears throat> My point being, while it may not be as popular as Final Fantasy, Monster Hunter, or Pokemon, it's not like the Tales series is obscure or anything. So instead of wasting your time introducing you to its general concept or drawing up a timeline that would probably be inaccurate within the next couple of months, I want to put together a kind of constructive defense for its titles. Not as a whole, because, um, I don't think I could defend some of them if I wanted to. I'm going to give you my top 5 list of Tales series games that I can defend and think would be well worth your time, emotional investment, and money. Just as a disclaimer before we get started, Tales series games are usually rated T and tend to deal with some pretty heavy stuff. I won't be showing anything uncomfortable in this video, but I thought it was worth mentioning anyway. If you decide you want to buy one of them, you might want to take a minute to look up some content warnings beforehand. Okay, let me preface this by admitting that I've put Tales of Legendia on this list at all, in part due to nostalgia. I spent countless hours playing this game as a kid, so many in fact that I'm kind of jealous of Kid Me's mental fortitude. I mean, if the portions of my childhood that I haven't completely blocked out serve, it wasn't too solid, but it had to have been better than it is now because I eventually had to mute the TV I was using while I was recording this footage. There's just something about hearing over and over and over again that really tested my endurance this time around. Nostalgia and aside, to give a brief synopsis, Tales of Legendia is primarily about this guy, Fisty McPunchy, whose name is actually Sentinel. In the introduction sequence, we see him and another character named Shirley, who he later reveals to be his younger sister, attacked by some kind of sea monster and washed up on a landmass that turns out to be a ship. Its inhabitants? Yes, inhabitants. This ship is large enough to facilitate cultures and ecosystems. Refer to it as the Legacy. We don't get a clear-cut explanation as to how it was built or for what purpose, but it is revealed that it's a remnant of an ancient and highly advanced civilization. Turns out, Senel's sister Shirley has something to do with this ancient and highly advanced civilization, because her being on board causes a sick light show to happen, which in turn attracts a lot of pursuers, presumably because they also want the power to make sick light shows happen. Again, not very clear cut. For the sake of those who haven't played and might want to, we're not going to touch on it much more anyway. Instead, I can start talking about the things I like most about this game, and its atmosphere is definitely at the forefront of that. Every environment feels fantastical and unique from the environments I've seen in other RPGs, even other Tales games, and most of that can be attributed to really solid, thoughtful, and themed art direction. We've got an oceanic setting, so to match the theme of that, you add oceanic enemies, oceanic vibes, plot points that revolve around the ocean and water in general, and lovable oceanic mascot characters. He's so cute! Like cute little otters who wear clothes, dance, and speak human speak. Oh my! That's textbook right there. A lot of it also has to do with the game's soundtrack being one of the best and most entrancing I've ever heard. If you ask me, it's really the core of what makes the atmosphere I'm praising stand out so much. Beautiful visuals can really be accentuated by beautiful sounds. If it wasn't made evident by the dancing otters, Tales of Legendia also has a lot of goofy cutscenes and an extremely eccentric cast that initiates them, which some might not appreciate as much, but I think it's a part of its charm. I always prefer the characters that I'm going to be staring at and hearing talk for 50 plus hours to be at least somewhat quirky and have senses of humor. 
Even if their quirks and senses of humor can sometimes be a little... Ah, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Perverted and dumb? I said cut it out. And I said let me go. Hey, don't touch me there, you perv. That was an accident. I wouldn't want to touch you anyway. Hey, that was uncalled for. Yeah, that sounds about right. And I'm taking that back, by the way. Watching that clip again made me realize that I definitely don't want characters who have personalities or any kind of media at all if it means the media is going to be littered with nasty. If you need to make your characters as bone dry and boring as possible to avoid putting objectifying boob jokes into your script, then, um, well, that's pretty pathetic, for one. You're a bad writer, but please do so. And that's pretty much where the game starts to suffer. Some outdated humor and pointless love triangles is all it really takes for me. Then on top of that, you've got a battle system that isn't boring per se, but it doesn't necessarily leave you wanting for more either. After a while, it can get pretty repetitive if you know what I mean. And even though Tails combat is pretty consistently short and sweet, and each enemy encounter that isn't a boss fight only lasts a minute at most, they still accumulatively make up like half of your gameplay, if not more. So to not particularly enjoy any of that is a pretty big problem to have. There's one more reason this game is as low as it is on my list. It hasn't gotten any kind of re-release. So if you don't still have a functioning PlayStation 2 and some spare pocket change to dump on an old copy someone has listed on eBay, you're probably out of luck. That being said, if you do have a functioning PlayStation 2, some of that previously mentioned spare pocket change and think you can tolerate or ignore the parts that haven't aged super well, Tales of Legendia's aesthetics and storyline might surprise you. After I finally got around to finishing Tales of the Abyss a couple years after its initial release, I fell out of the series for a pretty long time. Partially because I had other RPGs in my backlog, like the Persona series for example, and partially because school was sucking all of the life from my body. I was also kind of adverse to playing an Xbox 360 game of all things, but the dog-like companion finally won me over. This game is set in a world where monsters roam, not unlike other RPGs at large, but in this unusual case, the monsters seem to have no qualms wandering into noisy human settlements and roughing them up. In response, the humans of the world have tapped into an ancient technology called Blastia, which are essentially energy generators, to ward them out of their towns and cities. The story begins when a mage swipes the Blastia that the poorer citizens of an imperial city depend upon for clean water. Our main character, Yuri, who happens to be a former knight and a bit of an anti-hero, sets off to swipe it back. And in the attempt, he gets thrown into the castle dungeon, stages a jailbreak, almost gets assassinated by a guy who thinks he's his childhood friend, and becomes a cross-country escort for a noblewoman who needs to relay a message to the very same childhood friend. Pretty crazy turnout for what should have been an average Tuesday. The noblewoman, who Yuri calls Estelle, doesn't actually tell him what the message that needs to be relayed is. Just that it's a matter of life and death. Nah. She just says that it's important. I mean, it might be a matter of life and death. You'll have to find out if and when you play it or read the wiki, because we're done talking about it. What we're going to talk about instead is the battle system and some of the systems that coincide with it, because it's some of my absolute favorite stuff that the game has to offer. So the battle system in Vesperia has a lot of elements that the standard entries in the series do. You have a basic attack and you have arts, some of which are melee oriented and others that are casting oriented. What I want to draw attention to is this. Look at this. This magic spell I'm casting has a radius, not just a target. A radius that I have full control over. It's like all of the freedom of using a brush tool in an image editing program, but deadly. And I like it. Then there's the skill system. In this particular installment of the series, you don't get new skills simply by leveling up. You get them by keeping certain weapons equipped to your characters for long enough. 
At first, I was a little bit wary of the concept. All it would have taken to get frustrating would be some poor balancing, but it's actually really well executed. I never found myself struggling or thinking that a particular skill I was really adamant about getting was taking too long. Not to mention the fact that you're able to use the skills in battle before you even unlock them just by keeping the weapon that grants them equipped. Sort of like a free trial. So nice incentive and a satisfying reward for some grinding and spending that you'd probably be doing anyway. And last but not least, we have the cooking system, which you can use as a means of restoring help, tech points, or granting stat boosts for the next battle you'll be jumping into. This is also a Tales series standard, but what Vesperia does that I haven't seen in other Tales games is that if you have different characters cook different recipes, sometimes they'll diverge from the recipe in a way that unlocks new recipes. Not sure how that progression would ever happen in real life, but it's still a fun line of thinking that encourages you to play around and try every character and food combination you can think of. Other than all of that, Asperia in general is just plain beautiful to look at. Even playing it 10 years after its initial release, I'm just as enamored with its graphics and art style as I was originally. I have a small gripe about the developers not making Estelle the main protagonist, seeing as the story is mostly about her journey and character development, but Yuri is also an interesting protagonist in his own way, mostly because he's unconventional. Tales series games tend to be coming-of-age stories featuring a main character in their early to late teens, but Yuri, being a grown adult and having experienced a vast variety of things growing up, stands out from the bunch. He acts more as a mentor for the younger characters of the group, pointing out things that they may only be aware of subconsciously and supporting them in a way that a weird older brother probably would. It's actually very cute to behold. Alongside that small gripe, I have an even bigger gripe, which is that the game received a PS3 port with additional content, including two new playable party members, but this port was never released outside of Japan. Meaning, while those of us in other regions of the world play the Xbox 360 version, we have to cope with the fact that there's an updated version out there that we won't get to experience if we don't shell out a ridiculous amount of money to import it and a Japanese console. Bearing that cursed knowledge in mind, Tales of Vesperia is still a JRPG well worth playing, so if you've got an Xbox 360 sitting around and have an itch to try a new one, dust it off and give it a whirl. As a bit of a heads up, I don't feel too strongly about Tales of the Abyss. I enjoyed it enough to recognize that it was a really solid entry in the series, but it never jumped out at me and captured my heart like some of the others do, so I don't have as much to say about it as I'd necessarily like to. It was still too good to leave off of this list though, so I'm gonna do my best to do it some justice regardless. Bear with me. Luc von Fabre is the son of a noble house in the kingdom of Kimlaska. He's also a survivor of a kidnapping incident that caused him to develop psychogenic amnesia, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that the trauma of the event made him lose his memory. As a result of this kidnapping, his family grew extremely protective of him, and his uncle, the king, refuses to let him leave his mother and father's mansion until he comes of age. In the confines of the mansion, he whittles his time away spending it with his best friend and servant, training under his swords master, and denying the romantic advances of the princess of the kingdom, who also happens to be a childhood friend he proposed to of his own accord. Obviously, he doesn't have any recollection of this on account of the memory loss. One day, a woman infiltrates the family's mansion in the middle of one of Luke's training sessions with the intent of assassinating his master. Luke does what he can to defend him, and in a flash of light, something resonates between he and the woman, and the two are teleported away. Ooh, mysterious. So I have two things in particular that I really want to give compliments to. One, Tales of the Abyss has something that I've decided to call frustratingly satisfying character development. If your experience with it is anything like mine, you will hate Luke starting out. His scripted actions and transparent mistakes will drive you out of your mind. 
and if there was no payoff for having to deal with his behavior, the game would be completely insufferable. But I can promise you that the payoff is there and beyond good. In fact, Luke's emotional and mental growth over the course of the narrative is some of the best and most fulfilling that I've ever seen. In line with the writing, something else that the game does a really good job with is its usage of the amnesiac protagonist trope, which some think is overused and even more so overused in a sloppy way. Rest assured though, in this particular case, it's not just there as an excuse for the developers not to create a backstory for their focal character. The narrative doesn't stop reminding you of its presence because it's integral to the plot as well as the characters involved and does have an explanation. So don't get discouraged. Just be patient and the lore won't let you down. Two, the battle system, which is simple but effective. The most notable aspect of it is its phonon field subsystem. To explain in the simplest of ways possible, phonon fields are just patches on the ground aligned with a certain element. These patches are created when a party member or enemy uses an art or a special attack that's also aligned with an element. The phonon fields can then be used by the same character or any other character to add an elemental punch to a different compatible art. The catch is that the fields themselves only last for about 5 seconds apiece and can't be moved once they're activated. So there's actually quite a bit of attention and calculation that goes into utilizing them effectively. And landing a really nice hit is twice as satisfying as a result. A lot of people I know who are just as big on the Tales series as I am would probably put Tales of the Abyss somewhere closer to number one, if not at number one. And even though I don't agree with that opinion myself, I do agree that it's a really solid game and brings a lot of cool and refreshing stuff to the table. And on top of all of that, it also had a fairly recent 3DS port that played pretty well in my brief experience with it. So if you can't get your hands on an original PS2 copy, the handheld edition might be a good route. At a very reluctant number two, I have Tales of Zillia, and I only say reluctant because it was so hard to choose between it and my number one choice. Zillia was another entry in the Tales series that I played years late, and this time around it was actually pretty frustrating, because come the time I finished, I had a lot of things I wanted to say about it and only two people to say them to. One of those people being the person I sat and played it with in the first place. The game and its sequel, which was released only a year after the fact, had basically stopped being relevant, which is a huge shame because they're so solid that I keep returning to them and replaying them even now. The biggest highlight of the game is that you have two protagonists you can choose between before you begin to play, Jude and Mila, and Mila is a woman, a long overdue series first. Each have their own campaigns that intersect at times and diverge at others. They're both fun and rewarding to play through, back to back or individually, but I can't recommend that people play both more. Doing so doesn't only give you a richer understanding of the plot, but it makes Jude and Mila's arc as foils all the more interesting. So how does our story begin? As it happens, Mila is the lord and protector of all spirits, and sensing that the lesser spirits are dying, she sets off to find out why. Meanwhile, Jude is a university med student on the last leg of his education, and through his eyes, we discover that the spirits dying is causing problems for humans too. In Rize Maxia, humans and spirits have a symbiotic relationship where the humans will call on the aid of the spirits to perform certain tasks, and in return, they'll offer the spirits some of their mana, or energy. The lack of spirits coming to the aid of the humans is causing a bit of a channeling failure epidemic, namely among workers who are trying to channel spirits to do their jobs. Acutely aware of this epidemic after treating some patients in his professor's stead while he ran an errand, Jude hears that the very same professor will be receiving an academic award. And seeing as he's the only one who knows where he went to run his errand, he takes on the task of visiting the city's military research facility to relay the news to him. 
It's at the military research facility that he's fed the obviously false information that his professor has already left and has denied entry. While he's trying to figure out what to do from there, he stumbles across Mila, who's attempting to break in. Concerned for the safety of his professor and not having much else of a choice, Jude follows after her and enters the building through the hole she blew in the wall. And they unearth government secrets, probably. Human experiments. Horrible weapons of war. You know, how like, 99% of JRPGs go? Anyway, that's enough plot. I have to gush about the battle system. It's my favorite rendition in the whole series, because it's a perfect blend of all of the elements I like from the battle systems in other Tales games. The linking subsystem is the uncontested star of the show. What linking does is sync the character you're playing as with another, which allows you to tag team and corner enemies, combine their arts to perform powerful linked arts that you can chain to ridiculous degrees the more arts and practice you have, and and get backed up by a support skill. Each character has their own support skill that matches up with their personality and can be beneficial in all kinds of situations in battle. Linking with a character isn't something that you need to commit to on the pause menu before the start of a battle either. You can link and unlink with as many characters as you like as battles progress, and it's as easy as the tap of a button. The playstyles of all six of the game's playable characters are also unique and well-defined, which makes experimenting with all of them a huge breath of fresh air. Just to describe a few, Rowan, a caster, has a rhythm game-esque element to his spellcasting. Pressing certain buttons at the right times will allow you to add some variety to his spells, whether it be additional hits or changing the way they move. Another spellcaster in the party, Elise, has two modes that you can toggle between depending on whether or not you want to be on the front lines. Toggling the melee mode off will allow her to run faster to quickly put distance between her and the enemies on screen so she can cast, which is such a smart design decision. Just like with the support skills, their personalities are reflected in the standard battle skills they can learn too. My absolute favorite example of this is Jude's Feign Death skill. It allows you to do exactly what it says. Restore health and TP by pressing down on the joystick and pretending to be dead. I always get such a kick out of that, I can't even express it. And seeing as we're talking about the characters and how standout they are in battle, I thought I could say some cool things about how standout they are outside of battle. But I don't want to spoil the story or too much of their development, so we're gonna do this rapid fire and completely out of context. Rowan, the caster I mentioned briefly before, is an old man. He's a main party member, but he's 62 years old and has gray hair. Another Tales series first, but he's not reduced to the pervert archetype that a lot of old men you tend to see in anime are. He's actually very charming, good-humored, and has depth. You know how I was complaining about love triangles in regards to Tales of Legendia? This installment also has a love triangle but it's written well. You heard that right. It has a meaningful ending for each character involved and the character whose feelings inevitably aren't reciprocated gets to grow as a person, remain on good terms with the others, and not be bitter. Wild concept. Alongside having great characters, Zillia has extra spice and accessibility in the form of accessories that you can place on the character models, and one of the best questing organization systems I've seen in RPGs as a whole. The accessories are even retained during cutscenes in battle for all kinds of added cuteness and hilarity. In conclusion, if you want to play a JRPG that's equal parts on-point writing and well-thought-out addicting gameplay, trust me, get Tales of Zillia. It's for the PS3, and if you really want to get a physical copy, you can, but the digital version is on sale on the PlayStation Network pretty much all the time. Before we move on though, let's touch on Tales of Zillia too. Not saying much about Zillia's plot was my own personal choice, but in the case of Zillia 2, I'm not going to say anything because it's a spoiler in and of itself. Just for a little context, it takes place one year after the events of the first game and plays with a balance of old subject matter and new concepts that are brought about by new characters. A core feature of the game involves making choices and initiating branching paths that can result in a total of three different story-based endings. Like most games with multiple multiple endings, one is characterized as normal, another is bad, and the last of the three is the true, most fulfilling ending. Morality and divergences play heavy roles all throughout the narrative, and the results of some of the decisions you have to make do a little more than tug at your heartstrings. 
Before I started playing, a friend told me that I would almost definitely cry like a baby. And they were spot on. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that Tales games dabble in heavy stuff, but being fully aware of that and having played what felt like a million of them before didn't even come close to preparing me for how ridiculously sad Zillia 2's story is. So if you decide to pick it up once you've beaten the original, which you 100% should, don't forget to bring a box of tissues. You'll need it. Okay, so here's Tales of Symphonia. This is Tales of Symphonia. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I love this game. I love it to pieces. My game guide for the original GameCube version was also loved to pieces. Trust me, this is a testament. I take really good care of my game guides. The cover isn't even attached to the spine anymore. At this point, I just kind of use it as a bookmark. Getting back on track though, Tales of Symphonia is actually the game that got me into the types of games that most people think of when they talk about RPGs. It's also the game that set my standards so high, which is probably why I critique a lot of other stuff so harshly. So, what is Tales of Symphonia even about? Once upon a time, there existed a giant tree that was the source of mana. A war, however, caused this tree to wither away, and a hero's life was sacrificed in order to take its place. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you, Cam Clark. Your narration is beautiful, but this video's already super long, so let's just summarize instead. In the world of the game, which its inhabitants call Silverant, the survival of all things is dependent upon an energy source called mana. Without it, Droughts occur, plants don't grow, technologies can't advance, and people don't get to eat or really subsist in general. Every 100 years or so, the world will run low on mana and it will need to be replenished. The process of replenishing it is sending a designated member of the mana lineage, which is basically the closest thing there is to a royal family, on a perilous pilgrimage to offer prayers, unleash seals, and awaken spirits at four shrines throughout the land. Once the journey is complete, this designated member of the mana lineage, otherwise known as the Chosen One, will have attained otherworldly powers, become an angel, and possess the ability to regenerate the world. We follow this era's Chosen, a girl named Colette, as well as her two best friends Lloyd and Genus as they stumble into and throughout the journey of world regeneration. I could say more about the plot, in fact, I could say a lot more, because there's so much false information handed to you throughout the course of this game. The things that are cemented as truths from various sources at any given point are turned on their heads so frequently that it can make your head spin. But witnessing these twists as well as the way the characters perceive and respond to them are a big part of why the narrative is one of the best I've ever watched unfold. And that's exactly why I want to make a point to leave it as nebulous as possible. If anyone watches this video and decides to play the game for themselves, that'd make me ridiculously happy, for one. And for two, I'd like it to be as blind as it was for me. Concept spoilers aside, what makes me love this game so much? Well, first and foremost, the world. Even with its cutesy, cartoony graphical style, which some would criticize baselessly, each town, dungeon, and rest stop you visit feels real and alive. It just gives you the impression that, even though your quest is definitely the most important thing going on right now, there are still other things happening and characters that aren't directly involved with dynamic personalities and aspirations. And that's something I really appreciate. I get a very similar feeling from Zelda games now that I'm thinking about it, so you know it's a good one. Next, there's the sheer amount of content that this game has to offer. When it was first released on the GameCube, the package contained two discs, one for the first two-thirds of the game and another for the latter third. This wasn't unheard of for RPGs at the time. In fact, a lot had more than just two, but it attests to its capacity nonetheless. The issue of discs aside, 
Half the reason I asked my mom to buy me a game guide in the first place is because Tales of Symphonia doesn't only have a ridiculous quantity of bonus cutscenes, secret bosses, hidden treasures, costumes, an invisible affection system that determines the intensity of the relationships between the main character and his party members, and side quests that you can miss if you aren't paying enough attention or just aren't in the right place at the right time, but there are also multiple choices you can make that, in certain cases, alter the course of the story pretty severely. I'd be more specific, but it pertains to extremely late game stuff, so once again, we're gonna leave it vague. Just take my word for it. In the midst of this quantum buttload of content, there are also areas you don't even necessarily see during the main campaign. My favorite being this quaint little peninsula town called Cat's Village. To put it simply, it's a village entirely populated by cat people, but not in the traditional anime sense you might be thinking. I mean people in cat suits. They're literally just people who wear big pink cat suits that aren't sexualized in any way, shape, or form. The older I get, the more I appreciate them. You actually find these very same cat people all throughout the game, stationed in various settlements to offer their services and sometimes even engage you in simple but rewarding minigame sequences. Which makes going out of your way near the end and finding an entire civilization full of them completely extra in the best of ways. I also want to mention that the battle system, while simple seeming at first glance, has a lot of cool things going on with it. You know how I mentioned that Tales of Vesperia's cooking system makes you want to experiment with different combinations for different outputs? Tales of Symphonia's battle system has elements like that. You have the ability to soup up your party members with these stones called EX Gems. And once you've set one, you can choose and alternate between one of four perks that your character will receive in battle. Some of these perks are the same across across the board, but every character has at least one perk per level of gem that's unique to them and their fighting style. These perks are called EX Skills. If you set multiple EX gems and experiment with different EX skills, you have a chance of unlocking what's called a Compound EX Skill, which provides a brand new additional perk that your character will retain alongside the others, just so long as you don't switch out the EX skills you use to unlock it. There are a million different formulas to discover, and mixing and matching to create your perfect setup per character is so unbelievably fun, especially when you find a combination so effective that it breaks their level scaling. Lastly, the absolute best part, the characters and the writing. If you've played a lot of JRPGs, you've gotta know the archetypes pretty well. But Tales of Symphonia puts such a good and meaningful spin on all of these archetypes that no part of it or them ever feels stale. Not to mention the fact that there's no end to the extraneous dialogues that can take place between all of them. For as jam-packed as the story is, the developers took extra care in making plenty of room for the characters to have desires, come to their own conclusions, develop, and interact with one another. And because of all of that care, Whenever I think of characters that I care for and sympathize with in media, the Symphonia cast never fails to stand out. In terms of ports, a lot of people swear by the original GameCube version, and I can see why, especially if it's for nostalgia's sake. But it's not like there's anything discernibly wrong with the PS3 version either. The most I hear people complaining about is the frame rate being locked at 30 FPS, which doesn't bother me? No offense or anything, but I don't really get why it bothers other people. I mean, it looks fine as is. Not to mention the fact that the PS3 version has all of the cool additions that the Japan-exclusive PS2 version did, plus some free costumes based on characters from Tales games that have come out in more recent years. But regardless of which version you pick up, you'd be picking up one of the best and most thought-provoking RPGs out there. I seriously can't recommend Tales of Symphonia enough. Oh, right! There's also a sequel! It's called Night of Ratatosk in Japan and Dawn of the New World in North America and was originally released on the Wii, but a remastered version is included in the PS3 port which is probably why it's called Tales of Symphonia Chronicles and not just Tales of Symphonia in the first place. Whoops! Just like in Tales of Zillia's case, the original is definitely the better game, at least as far as I'm concerned. 
But Dawn of the New World offers some interesting perspective on what the world we see in Tales of Symphonia is like two years after the events of the first game. It introduces a bunch of concepts that never really came to fruition during its predecessor's story, including new characters, lore, and a monster recruiting mechanic. It also tied up some loose ends that had fans scraping the bottom of the barrel for five years, give or take. What's more, it's also pretty cool to see characters from the original installment fleshed out, moving and expressing themselves in ways that just weren't possible in the original game's modeling style. So if you finish the first game and have a craving that no game that isn't a sequel and or spin-off will satisfy, give it a go. You might not be wowed and dazzled, but you also won't be disappointed, especially if you already spent the money to buy Chronicles anyway. Whew. So that's my top 5 Tales games. What do you guys think? Was there a game I didn't include that you would have? Or were there even more good things I didn't mention about the 5 games I picked? I'd love to hear about your favorites and thoughts, so feel free to drop them in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching! All of my social media accounts are in the description below, and if you like RPGs, you might like Dapper Volk, an avatar and pet site with RPG elements. I did some videos about it, so feel free to check those out and subscribe on your way out to see more in the future. Thanks again, and see you next time!